Well, thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, I want to tell you something about, in fact, those tiles that were just referred to. Uh, let me tell you something about crystalline patterns. I hope the focus is going to be right. Let's try it. Yeah. Looks good. Very good. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I imagine a pattern on the plane. I'm really talking about plane patterns for the moment, uh, and there is a result which is probably known to the Greeks, which is that the only kind of crystalline patterns you can have, I'll take that away, are, when I say it's a crystalline pattern, I mean you have a, imagine a lot of points on the plane, and such that if you move it along, translate it in some direction, the pattern looks just the same. Or you can move it along in another direction, the pattern looks just the same. But they're discrete points. Uh, now it might also have some other symmetry, like a two-fold symmetry. So you imagine a pattern of rectangles, like uh, of the parallelograms, like this. So you have you could have some point at each corner of the parallelograms. Now you can slide them along, either this way or that way, and the pattern would look just the same. It goes, you imagine it goes all the way out to infinity. But if you take the center of one of these parallelograms, you could rotate the whole pattern through 180 degrees and it would look just the same as before. So that's got two-fold symmetry. That's now you could imagine a pattern with three-fold symmetry made out of, say, equilateral triangles and take the center of each, any one of these triangles and then you rotate that through 120 degrees and it'll go into itself and so on. Or you could have a pattern of squares that's fourfold symmetric or sixfold if it's hexagons. And the theorem is that th those are the only numbers you can have for a crystalline pattern. And there's a proof of it which I can just outline here. Uh, see here, this red point here is meant to be a center of n-fold symmetry for some n. n could, I'm going to try and show it's got to be one of these numbers. Uh, well, suppose that's one such point. Now, if it's going to have translational symmetry, that means you slide it along, the pattern is the same for some distance of sliding. There must be another one of these points, which is also an n-fold symmetry point. And I'm going to assume that these two points are as close as they could possibly be for that pattern. So that's the minimum distance between n-fold symmetry points. Now, Okay, what we're going to do then is to take this n-fold symmetry point and rotate it about that one by the symmetry. So if I take it 360 degrees divided by n, see that's, I'm going to go n, if I did it n times I'd be all the way, all the way around, but 360 degrees over n is going to be a symmetry of the pattern. So this whole pattern goes down to there, it'll be just the same. So this symmetry point will go into another one. Likewise, I could rotate this one about that and get another symmetry point. So these two points will also be points of n-fold symmetry, but you see they're closer than those ones, and that's a contradiction. So that means that if these are closer, you, these weren't the minimum to begin with, so you're assuming they were, so that's a contradiction. Well, the only way around this is to take one of these cases here. If n is 2, then those two points are not closer. You see they're further away. If n equals 3, they're still not closer. If n equals 4, they're just the same distance as those two. And if n equals 6, they just happen to coincide. So that gets away with it too. But any other number, such as, well, n equals 5 is the only one where they don't cross over. Anything else, these two points will be closer than those. And that's a contradiction. And therefore, they won't work. So the only ones that do work Although these ones we should get away with it. So there's the proof, more or less. Now, how about that pattern? Well, you see that one evidently has five-fold symmetry, and it looks pretty well like a repeating pattern. In fact, it practically is. Uh, it's well, in fact, this particular pattern would have fivefold symmetry about the central point. It's almost 
translational symmetry. So that if you slide, that I could first of all say this pattern could be continued indefinitely right out to infinity. But it has the property that you could slide it along by a certain amount and it's almost exactly as it was before. In fact, that almost can be taken in a very strong sense. If you give me some percentage, less than 100%, say 99%, then I could find a distance to move this along so that it would agree to 99%. That is, if I take the points, the corners of the polygons in the pattern, then 99% of them would agree when I slide it. Then you say, well, can you do any better than that? Yes. So I take 99.9 percent, then I could find another distance and move that along so that this pattern agrees to 99.9 percent. In fact, that would be true of any percentage you choose, less than 100 percent, and so it's almost completely uh, translational symmetry. And of course, this point in the middle, which is a five-fold symmetry point, will go to another point, which is 99.9 uh, percent .9 of whatever you choose. Let's say 99.9. Okay, you say, how does this? See, so, you know, in an actual crystal, you don't expect it to be absolutely perfect, so you might think any percentage just less than 100% will be good enough. Well, you see, how does this wriggle through this proof here? Well, let's suppose these points are 99.9% .9 symmetry points, and if you rotate a 99.9% .9 symmetry point about another, this one's likely to be only maybe 99.8%. So that these ones won't be quite as accurate as symmetry points as these were. Be, you'll lose a little bit. They're closer, but you lose a little bit at the same time. So there's a trade-off. And by the time you get down to the size of the cell here, you are going to have lost all your, sim all your accuracy. So that's how you get around the, that's how you get around the, the, the proof I just gave you. OK, well, let me tell you how this pattern is constructed. And in fact, first of all, let's have a close-up. So I'll show you, if you look a little closer, it'll look like something like that. Now that's built up out of regular pentagons. Here we have them, there. Regular pentagons. And, well, there's a few other shapes you need. You need this star shape here. There's another one. You need the rhombus, that little diamond shape. And you also need this thing, which I call a, a jester's cap which has got three spikes to it. That way up, you see it looks like a jester's cap. Um, so you've got those four shapes all together, the pentagon, the rhombus, the star, and the jester's cap. OK, how is that built? Well, for some reason, one of my transparencies has disappeared, but uh, I can make do with this one. What I'm going to do is to imagine a pentagon. Let's just take, say, that one there, which there's, you have a pentagon and it's subdivided into six smaller ones. There's five around the outside and one in the middle. Six smaller ones, if we ignore these little gaps here, that's what we've done. And then I want to repeat that, so I'm going to subdivide each one of these in just the same way that one was subdivided, and then blow it back up to the original scale. So here we have the original big pentagon subdivided into six smaller ones, and then each of those has gone into six smaller ones. Now there's going to be some gaps, and we have this little rhombus shape. See, originally we had a little triangle missing, and those two little triangles come together to make this diamond rhombus shape. But the next stage, here we have one, the next stage, when that one's subdivided, and all these are, there'll be a little spike coming out of the rhombus like this. So we have a, a spiky rhombus for the gap. And what are we going to do with that? Well, this is what we're going to do with it. We're going to find there's just room for another pentagon in there. And now we've got these star and the jester's cap. OK? And uh, well, now we're going to do it again. Next time, when we subdivide this, and imagine we're going to blow it up each time, then everything is going to get a, get a little spike on it, like this. Well, the jester's cap now will look like this, it's, but it's got bigger. I've got spikes all the way around. And now I have room for three more pentagons, a star, and three more jester's cap. If we had a star, 
that will grow little spikes like this and we have room for five more pentagons another star and five just as caps so we can keep on going because each of these shapes that we, the new shapes we get are always just the same as the shapes we had before so that we're going to be able to see what to do with it when this gets blown up you see each of these will grow spikes there all the way around and we can fill this one up in just the same way we, as we've indicated the one thing that you might slightly worry about here is that the rhombus here could be done either way how do you know whether to put the pentagon up there or down there well you could say well just take your pick but we can do better than that and there is a specific rule which I'm going to say we follow that's to say this one's right this is wrong well see here is the spiky rhombus over here and then what you find is that always either on this side or this side one way up or the other you will have this arrangement of pentagons I'll show you how that comes in a minute um, and then the rule is so you don't know what to put there yet the rule is that you look about that symmetry line and flip this one over there and that tells you this should be in that position and not that one See, the other thing you might have done is to put it here and I'm saying that's wrong well you might say why didn't you take this rule and the thing is if you take this rule the next stage what you do in the middle is inconsistent on the two sides so this doesn't work but that one does work and you can keep on going okay so let me just show you the well perhaps, perhaps I should just explain what, why this one you see what you do is you look for the pentagons in that arrangement I just showed you they were here and what you find I don't know if I can the scale isn't quite the same but, uh, but you can see roughly speaking this pentagon let me do it here this pentagon is that one this one is that one this one is that one and so on and then because this one will be subdivided there'll be one there that's, that's this one so that tells you this one over here has got to be in whichever position it is the down the lower position I guess okay now just to sort of remind you these are the things we do if we ever have a a star when it gets its spikes you do that to it the uh, jester's cap you do this to it and the rhombus that with the rules indicated here and the original pentagon that way and you just keep on going okay well let's try it and see what happens uh, here we have a well suppose you ma imagine you had some big pattern and we've been going for a while and here is one of the pentagons and now I'm going to subdivide that into these six smaller ones this one will have been subdivided and that one also okay and now we're going to do it again here we are so these orange ones well first of all you have to make sure I've done this one right so that uh, rhombus gets its spikes like that and so why is this one here where you chase this pentagon pattern you see because this one was over here you take the symmetry about that line this is in that place so it's correctly done uh, uh, what's next we're going to subdivide again and I hope these things fit uh, yeah, I think so. More or less, anyway. Okay. And you have to chase and make sure all these rhombuses are done right, but that, that is the pattern. Okay, we'll have a good look at that because I'm going to take away those and we're just left with that pattern. Now, you see, that pattern was constructed with this kind of hierarchical uh, procedure. Now, you might think you should could see that in there so it's a nice challenge you see can you find the original big pentagons that I had to uh, construct the pattern it's not so easy it has a, a uniformity about it that isn't quite doesn't quite reflect the uh, hierarchy that was used to construct it in the first place in fact let me tell you some features that this pattern has you see in lots of places there are regular decagons, ten-sided regular 
polygons. And each time you find a regular decagon, such as there, or here's another one there, they're all over the place. Just wherever you point pretty well, there will be one. Uh, <laughs> you find that each time it has exactly the same things inside. Three pentagons, two rhombuses, and one jester's cap. It's always the same. Three pentagons, two rhombuses, one jester's cap. Three pentagons, two rhombuses, one jester's cap, and so on. And every time you find that, one of these rhombuses, uh, one of these decagons, you find surrounding it is a ring of ten pentagons. So here's another one there. There's a ring of ten pentagons. You'll find in various places there are a couple of the decagons overlapping. You see here they've got a rhombus in common. This one here and that one. And it doesn't make any difference. You still have rings of pentagons. They just go straight through each other without paying much attention. So there we are. All over the place. Sometimes you find rings, bigger rings like this. Rhombus, pentagon, 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 all the way around. And whenever you find that, they always surround one of these decagons with this ring of pentagons. So you see that kind of pattern persists. Moreover, it has a, another feature which I can point out. That is that if you take any line, like that one, in the diagram, if I can do it this way, and you continue it, you see it, it, oops, turn that off by mistake. <laughs> there we are. Uh, that's a good way of doing it there. You see that line is just part of one line which just keeps on going. And this is true whichever segment you take. It's always the case. This one there just keeps on going. In fact, then that has the property that you imagine there was a field like this and at each point on the picture, each vertex, you had a piece of uh, corn growing there. You see, suppose you had a field of corn and something growing at each one of these points here. And you're driving by in the car, you look over it and you see them all lining up like this. And then, a little while later, they'll all line up in a different direction. <coughs> <coughs> That's fine. I mean, you, you're used to seeing that sort of thing in the fields of corn. But what's a little unusual here is that the angle between one of these and the next one is some submultiple, well, it's some multiple of 72 degrees. Uh, and so you've, that's not the thing you normally expect. It seems to contradict the theorem that we started with. But as you see, it doesn't actually contradict it, it's, it just seems to. So you have this pattern which is uh, almost symmetrical, almost fivefold symmetrical, and almost translational symmetric. Uh, just manages to get away from um, not being a crystalline pattern. Well, another property of this pattern is that you could actually imagine it built up as a sort of jigsaw puzzle. You see, there are lots of ways of fitting these shapes together so that they don't form this. For example, you could just take the rhombuses and throw the others away, and they'd certainly tile the plane. Uh, but there are lots of other ways of doing it. But if we embellish these pieces a little bit, like that, so that we have three different versions of the pentagon, depending on what's around it. You see, these correspond to um, this one corresponds to one of these, where there are five other pentagons around it. This one to uh, one of, which one is it? These, where there are three other pentagons around it, and this one to one of these, where there's only two. And I've put little knobs and knobs on places and little notches out of them in places, such a way that you have to fit that in there, and sometimes you've got the spiky thing here that's got to fit in there, and so on. And these have got to fit in there and there. So I've embellished the, the star and the jester's cap and the rhombus and the three different versions of the pentagon in that way. And what you find, it's not so hard to show, is that the only way these six pieces will fit together is in one of these patterns here. So these, if you think of it as a sort of infinite jigsaw puzzle, you've got an infinite number of each of these pieces and you've got to cover 
the whole plane without any gaps or without any overlaps and without any overlaps so that they well, just cover the whole plane and you find that it has to do it in this never quite repeating way so this is what's called an aperiodic set of tiles or prototiles, that's the tile shapes which will only tile the plane in a way which isn't periodic which isn't repeating and in fact uh, I produced these things in 1973 and uh, somewhat later I, it was pointed out to me that uh, uh, mathematician Raphael Robinson had originally he had a set of six which also only tiles non-periodically that he produced in 1971 these came about from quite a different history I can explain a little bit about that um, there was a problem that was basically posed by a mathematician called Hao Wang Chinese-American mathematician who uh, well he was really only interested in square type tiles a bit like this and the question was if you're given a set of tiles how do you know whether you can tile the whole plane with them could you have a computer program which says yes or no depending upon whether they will tile the plane and what Hao Wang showed was if it's the case that every set of tiles every set of um, let, let's, let me say that again yes if it's the case that every set of tile shapes that will tile the plane some way will actually tile the plane in a periodic way a repeating way if that's the case then there would be a computer program which would tell you yes or no but then his uh, I think it was a student of his that was um, Robert Berger who uh, worked at this a bit more thoroughly and he found that it wasn't true that there is no computer program there is no computer program which will answer yes or no for every every possible tile set you might give it correctly answer yes or no whether it will tile the plane or not and uh, in order as part of his argument he had to show that there was a set of tiles of course he had to do this by the previous theorem that Hao Wang had established he had to show that there was a set of tiles which will only tile the plane in a way which never repeats itself and he then produced an explicit set of these tiles which involved something like I think 200,000 different tile shapes uh, he was able to get this number down to something 109 or something I forget the exact figure he worked it way down that but then he gave up at that point and Raphael Robinson managed to get the number down to six so that's where it stood in, in 1971 and uh, uh, the, uh, in Oxford we were being visited by Simon Cochin who's a Princeton mathematician and uh, I showed him these tiles and he said uh, well you know Raphael Robinson has this set of six and he's a kind of person who's interested in getting the number down as small as possible so I thought to myself I said well I've got six too but I know I can do it with five and it's quite easy to see that from these tiles because all you need to do you see look at this funny star shaped thing there there's only one place where it goes in and so you've got to use this tile to put on all those pieces there and that won't make any difference so you don't need this tile you just glue it on here and you glue it there and there and now you've got a set of five tiles that will do it so that's a little better but I also well I played around for a bit with these things and realized you could actually whittle the number down to two and uh, it's more or less done like this here we have the two shapes, they are this thing called a, a kite and a dart and I've also marked the corners either black or white we have a matching rule, you've got to match black against black and white against white you could do this another way by having a little notch there or something but I, it, it looks a little more complicated if you do that so we just mark them black and white and you have to fit the tiles together uh, matching the blacks with blacks and whites with whites and uh, this is the only sort of way you can do it and to see what it has to do with what I've just been talking about each one of the kites can be marked with a line across there and then two little lines there and then I'm going to shade these little bits there and I do that exactly the same with each of the kites and then 
each of the darts has to be marked in this way, the two lines across there, and I shade that one. And you have to match the shadings, and uh, if you do that, then it just brings out the previous tiling. So you see there's a pentagon, there's the star, there is the rhombus, and there's a jester's cap somewhere, if I can find it. Here's one, yes. Jester's cap there. And then you've just got lots of pentagons. So it is, in fact, the same pattern as I had before, but the essence of it can be captured just with these, just these two tiles. Well, if you have a big arrangement of these tiles, they look like this. I should have had a colored version. And could, you could see a little bit more about how the pattern works, but I don't have that with me, I'm afraid. Uh, let's see, what else do we have? Got slightly out of order here. Uh, where are they? There's another one of those. Excuse me a minute. That's what I'm looking for, yes. There's another version. Now you see, they don't look quite like kites and darts, but they are. They looking, they're supposed to look a little bit more like birds or chickens or something, you see, that's what they are. It's in, sort of in the style of Escher. Uh, and just to show you, well, here are the, the two birds. Let me cover this up for the moment because it's, I don't want to confuse you with something else just yet. So there are the birds. And you'll see, what have they got to do with kites and darts? Well, there, you see, that's it. You have to just modify the shape of the edges a little bit. To in, in fact, it enforces the matching rule. So you see, I, whenever I see a long edge, I wiggle it in and out like that. And I do that here, and I wiggle it in the same way. You see, so that will, this one will fit against that one, and this one will fit against that one, and that one, and so on. And the short edges is modified in a slightly different way. And it forces them to match uh, in the way intended, and not the wrong way, which would be just simply to stick that thing right in there. That won't fit, you see. OK, so that's the uh, two chickens are really just some kites and darts. And this is, you see, these were based on a hierarchical prescription. And you can see this now in a sort of simple form in terms of the actual two birds. The big bird goes into two big birds and one little bird, the little bird into one big bird and one little bird. And then you see the next stage, you make the big birds into two big birds and a little bird, two big birds and a little bird, and a little bird goes to a little bird and a big bird. And the big bird goes to two big birds and a little bird, and this one you figure out, you see. <laughs> anyway, you keep on going like that, again and again and again and again, and uh, then you produce the patterns which I showed you. I should say I made these in, in the old days when people weren't so... Well, at least I wasn't, wasn't used to using computers, and I'm still not. But, uh, so I did these things by hand, basically. You would say, how did I draw that? Well, I, what I used to do is I'd draw the patterns and then take it down the road to the Xerox machine. They had a, you know, like Kinko's, but it wasn't called Kinko's. And you could, uh, I noticed that the machine reduced at exactly the right ratio. And so that I could take it home and then cut them out and then stick them back together again. And so I did that several times and produced this pattern. <laughs> okay, you could do it all, all with computers now, but uh, that's how I did it. <coughs> now, uh, there are other things you can do. And I'll just show you another version. These are, it's, it's very similar to the kites and darts. You just do it in a slightly different way. And here we have the thin rhombus and the fat rhombus. Now all the edges are the same length now. And you have a slightly different rule about matching. I've colored them, you put these lines in here. And uh, you have to match the colors and the edges and so on. And then you find that the only way they'll fit together is in a, uh, a non-repeating pattern of rhombuses. You can color them in a way like this, which looks like, like a very simple kind of child's play thing. What's not so obvious is that they will only fit together in a non-periodic uh, pattern. Now, if I can find the right picture, yes, here we are. I think I should put these down here.
Yeah, we can see them. That's it. Yeah, we can see them doing it at the top there. Just a, a limited array. We can uh, do it a little more smaller down. Now, this really is a computer picture. Uh, you can see it's made up of those little rhombuses, correctly assembled with the matching rules. Let me show you another one. That one you may not see, it's made of rhombuses, but it is. Uh, and uh, let me show you then what else you can do. You can see moire patterns. Let me uh, find, I can find the original one. <laughs> Let's, you can fix it, fix, find a good looking point like that one. Notice those lines going across. Those lines are where the patterns aren't exactly the same. There's a slight differences from one to another. But if you could have moved to an appropriate place, you can get them to agree as closely as you like. So let me try and find a better one. That's a pretty good one, yes. You see the lines get, if you find a good spot, the lines are pretty, are not very close. Let me find another one if I can. I mark this thing in a way which is supposed to help me, but um, <laughs> I'm not sure how much it's, <laughs> I'm not sure how much it is helping me. Let's try this here. I think that's meant to match that. And this is meant to match that, so let's find that one. Yeah. Give myself a crick in the neck, I think. Now, oh, where is there a good <laughs> Go back again and see if I can find it. Takes a bit of practice doing this, and they say. You've got to move it in just the way you don't expect. So they're just those lines. <laughs> There's an even better one I can find if I... <laughs> just, but uh, maybe I've got this upside down. No, that's it. Yes, there we are, yes. See if I can find that one. Um, oops. It went, it disappeared when I was... There's just one line across the middle. Mm. Everything else, the pattern is... This is an example of showing if you move them far enough away, you can get the patterns to agree uh, in larger and larger regions. So here you have huge areas where they agree exactly and only dis disagree along that line. Now these are patterns constructed in just the way I've been describing for you. Let me show you something else. These are patterns described and produced in a different way. <coughs> Namely, this is a substance, I think an aluminium manganese alloy, and uh, they are, these are electron micrograph pictures. So they have a lot of similarity to the patterns I've been showing you, particularly that it's just the same angles you have to rotate these things multiples of 72 degrees and they come back to where they were. But these are physical substances. And these are, this is a sort of diffraction pattern you can... Well, you, you, I won't go into the details there, but you send x-rays at these things and you get patterns like this or... You, depends on how you're doing it, patterns like this. Which indicate that these substances seem to be based on the kinds of arrangements that I'm showing you. In fact, there's been a lot of argument about that for a while. I think it's generally agreed that they are pretty well uh, based on that kind of pattern. There are now numbers of different ones known. The first ones 
was seen by Steinhardt, uh, by, um, sorry, Steinhardt was the person who produced the, just in case I should, I should say that these, these were produced by Paul Steinhardt, who's a professor in Princeton. Um, but uh, it's a man by the name Schechtman who first saw the patterns like this. These particular ones were made by somebody else. Um, but uh, Schechtman first saw these quasi-crystalline, as they're sometimes called, substances. And here's a picture produced by somebody called Gale in 87. And they look sort of like crystals, except that they're impossible as crystals because you get, for example, here you see this five-fold point. In fact, we can zoom in on that a bit and you see the sorts of crystalline appearance they have. They're very, very nice edges and vertices. In fact, nicer than you normally get with crystals. If you have a crystal, uh, uh, when I say a normal crystal with the ordinary symmetries, you tend to find little roofs and things here instead of clean points. Whereas these things seem to produce very clean points. The things at the bottom here are mathematical objects. Those are not, I don't know whether they can produce things like this now, I don't know. But uh, these are actually just uh, pictures of um, mathematical polyhedra. These are referred to as, this is what's called a, a rhombic tricontahedron. Tricontahedron just means it's got 30 faces and they're rhombuses. And, uh, that's a well-known shape. And you can see how very accurately these seem to be reproducing those exact mathematical structures. I think I'll just say a few more things about these. Uh, the five-fold ones are not the only ones. There are some nice, and I say just not the only ones, not the only ones theoretically, and not the only ones that are observed in quasi-crystals. Um, the, there's an eight-fold one that was produced by Robert Amand not long after I produced mine. There are some 12-fold ones, and here's an example of a 12-fold quasi-symmetric pattern. When, in the early days of when these things seem to be seen, I was visiting Zurich in Switzerland and uh, a man by the name of Nissen showed me his uh, diffraction patterns that he'd found from some copper, I think aluminium copper alloy, in which uh, he, he, well, he was claiming they had this kind of 12-fold symmetry and a lot of people didn't believe him and he showed me the diffraction patterns which looked like this. And I looked at that and I thought, well, that's a nice looking pattern. You could join these things up. That makes an equilateral triangle. You can join up the squares. And so I did that. And then I produced a pattern that I thought I'd seen before somewhere. I said, where have I seen that before? Well, forget about the letters in the middle. Uh, where had I seen that before? And I couldn't f remember where on earth it was. And finally, it came to me. I'd seen it on this arrangement of patterns, which was made by Johannes Kepler in 1619. <laughs> uh, now, here we have that particular pattern, FF, and uh, what he was doing, I have no idea, except exploring <laughs> the ways in which you can produce interesting patterns from other than the usual symmetries. And I was, I'd seen this, pa this picture actually quite some years before I produced my own patterns. And I think it was part of what made me think that pentagons were interesting and not such uh, dead objects for making patterns as you might have thought. For example, look at that pattern over there, which was made up out of pentagons and stars and so on. Very much like some of the things I've been showing you. But even more like some of the things I've been showing you is the largest pattern on the whole page, this one here. You see it's made up out of pentagons. Um, and here it is, a bit bigger. Uh, 
And what you can find is that, if I take an example of this, I'm not sure I've got exactly the right spot here because it's, I noticed that there's a slight discrepancy, but if you find the right place, you'll find it actually fits exactly. This one doesn't quite, there's a, there's a discrepancy there. But if I find another place, and I probably won't be able to, um, let's see if I can find it. I, uh, you can probably find it does fit exactly. Now, one minute. Let's try it this way. Uh, well, that's off the page. Yes, it doesn't fit down here. Um, let's try it this way. Well, it's pretty good. But you can actually find places where it does fit exactly. So, that's intriguing. What was Kepler doing in, 19, in 1619? I have no idea. Um, I once gave a lecture where I showed this picture, and there was a woman in the audience, this was in Oxford, a woman in the audience, and she said uh, that actually there is a correspondence between Kepler and someone else where he explained what he was doing with this pattern. And uh, I'd never seen that correspondence, and I, so I said, yes, I'd be fascinated if you could let me know. This was, I don't know, about 10 years ago. I still haven't heard from her, unfortunately. <laughs> so, so if any of you know, um, what on earth Kepler was doing, I'm really in interested to hear about it. Thank you very much. <laughs> of course, yes. Do you want to call them from yourselves or would you like us to? Well, I don't mind. Uh, anybody, anybody wants to say something, ask something? There's one over here, was there? Oh, in the corner, right. <laughs> yes. And I'm wondering if that's an apocryphal story or if that's a real story. I can, t I can tell you some of that story, but uh, the story, well, it depends what story you heard. It might be an apocryphal one. <laughs> 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 the true story is that I have to be careful what I say, I should say, about this, because um, I ha there's a company that makes tiles based on my designs with, with approval. And um, I wasn't particularly concerned by this matter, but uh, when we moved into a house, oh gosh, it must have been about um, 10 years ago, something like this, um, my wife noticed that, uh, she said, have you seen the toilet paper? And, <laughs> and I said, well, I've seen it, but not having my glasses on at the time, I didn't see what she was getting at. <laughs> so then I, I did have a good look and said, yes, it does look something familiar. Um, she seemed to think that this might, uh, might worry. That, well, I don't, we were, it's really more the people who, who produce the patterns, the puzzles. And so I w let them know about this, you see, and they decided they might try and make a, a case of it. So it was uh, uh, pursued. I should say that um, the, 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 big, the, the issue, the only issue that's of relevance here is uh, not whether somebody is using an exact mathematical structure for something, because that's public property. The issue was whether somebody had copied something, copied an actual pattern from somewhere, which would be an issue of copyright. And so that's what the, uh, that's what the case was about. All I can say, apart from that, is that uh, it was, there was an out-of-court settlement. And as part of the uh, conditions of this out-of-court out settlement, I'm not allowed to say what, <laughs> what the conclusions are. So I'm afraid I can't do any better than that. But you never have to buy toilet paper again. <laughs> <laughs> no, that doesn't follow at all. I think you can, I, but not from, it's not made by that company. <laughs> it's made by a different company. No, uh, I shouldn't really say anything about it, should I? <laughs> I haven't seen it for ages. Um, you might argue, what's the point? Because the, the, uh, the, the, the argument was that since the pattern is non... See, if you, if you have toilet paper which rolls and, and it kind of fits where it, where it becomes periodic, that's supposed to be not good. I think it's nothing to do with it, really, because, uh, <laughs> because, because the patterns, in fact, were not uh, exactly one of my patterns in any case. There was a re repetitive aspect to them. So... Uh, uh, but as I say, you can, you can. I have seen it, I think, 
Produced by some other company, yes, I think I heard. Yeah. I think a lot of it, well, you see, there's various morals of different kinds that you can deduce from all this. One is that uh, I wasn't looking for that. At, I mean, uh, there was a time, I mean, I, I like to play around with tiling, tilings and shapes and that sort of anyway. And one of the things had intrigued me. People sometimes ask me, not quite your question, but they would say, uh, you know, aren't you supposed to be discovering about the universe and what's the <laughs> what are you doing playing around with these shapes, you see? And so, well, I'd say, well, it's just fun. I mean, I did it for fun, so that's, that's all I need to say. But it wasn't quite that. It was, uh, in addition to that, I was interested in um, things with simple rules which produce complicated patterns. And uh, I was looking for tile shapes that, that tiled in complicated ways, even though they were uh, simple. And, and uh, I, in fact, thought of hierarchical tiling. So you could have a tile shape which will subdivide into smaller versions of itself and you keep doing that and then blow it back up. So that kind of thing I'd thought of before. And there are other kinds of shapes you can produce which, although they don't force that arrangement, they will tile non-periodically in, 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 in complicated ways. And so these were examples of things which might, might sort of be illustrating some aspect of the laws of physics and you could have simple laws which produce complicated patterns. In some sense, we have much better examples now with the Mandelbrot set, because there you have uh, a set which is produced by a very simple mathematical rule and has incredible complication in it. So there are many examples of such things known. But that was a motive, but perhaps not a very strong motive in what I was doing. It was more, uh, I just like geometry. I, I had seen this, and I think some, somewhere in my subconscious with this thought that you can do interesting things with pentagons, and uh, the other, only other thing I can say is that somebody had invited me to give a seminar in one of the London colleges and I hadn't replied to his letter for a long time and I was feeling very guilty and so I got round and I got his letter out there and I saw the logo at the top of the paper and it had a pentagon subdivided to sport into these six smaller ones like that. That's all it was, just that, you see. So I began to think, what happens if you do it again and again, you see. <laughs> and uh, and he produced these pretty patterns and pretty patterns, and then somehow the thought came to me that uh, you could maybe make this into a jigsaw puzzle. But I can't see. You know, I wasn't trying to. I wasn't certainly thinking of any new kind of crystal or anything like that. That's just uh, that just came along. And yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> quoting you, I, th I think this is quoting you. If I get my notes right. And uh, trying to see if, see if there's a connection between what you were doing, the patterns, and your statements. Yes. An adequate theory of mind must be founded on a physical theory, but there is not yet a physical theory adequate to the known nature of the material world. And I'm sitting here looking at the patterns that you're finding and you're creating, and I start thinking, well, does, can this evolve into a physical theory, or are you just <laughs> on a diversion here? Are, are we uh, in the same world, or are we in, in a different you know, uh, well, it's a different subject in a way. I mean, there is a connection in that um, these tile the prototypes, like tile shapes, mm -hmm. the fact that the, whether you can tile or not is not a computable prob issue. I mean, it's a, it's an example of something which I'd been interested in for other reasons, which is um, can mathematical understanding be described in terms of com computational procedures? And uh, there's this famous uh, theorem of Gödel, Kurt Gödel, which shows that if you have any precise system of rules, then there are always things that they won't access. And there are big arguments about these things, you see. The basic question is, is our thinking, when we're thinking about, say, mathematical thinking, it's only a very small area of thinking, of course, but, but just think about mathematical thinking, is mathematical thinking something that you could mirror precisely with some c computer program? See? And the claim is that, my claim, <laughs> is that this is not true. And the reason behind that claim is the, the uh, Gödel statement, which says that if you've given, given any set of computational rules for producing, well, for, for giving you what you would call a proof, an accepted mathematical proof, then what he shows is 
that there are always going to be some statements outside the scope of those rules, but not just that. Those are statements which, if you trust the rules, then you must also believe in the statements. You produce a statement which is not derivable using the rules, but is derivable using the understanding that tells you the rules are, use, are correct procedures. I mean, it's a little complicated statement there, you see. The thing is, that if you're prepared to use the rules, then you must believe that the rules are consistent, because otherwise you could prove 3 equals 7. Mm -hmm. And if 3 isn't equal to 7, then you shouldn't be able to prove it. So therefore, any rules that can prove 3 equals 7 aren't going to be a basis for mathematical um, uh, proof, if you like. So uh, if you believe your set of rules it does form a basis for mathematical proof, then you have to believe certain statements which li out lie outside the scope of those rules. So the argument, you know, people argue about these things, and I... If you understand it, yes. you program a computer, then there's going to be some things outside the scope yes, of that program. Yes, that's right. Whatever the program yeah. is... Yeah. Is that stuff that's well, what I'd say, say is it's understanding, you see. The, the claim is that whatever mathematical understanding is, and I don't claim to know what it is, but whatever it is, and it requires conscious thinking, you see, is something which is not rule-governed. There is something outside the following of rules which is involved in understanding and which is therefore involved in consciousness. Insight? Insight, yeah. That's, that's basically the sort of thing one's talking about, yeah. So there's something there it's still logical, if you like. It's still, it's not, it's not you're guessing or anything like that. It, but it's not rule-based. There's something outside purely following rules. And, and, under, and it, it's not so surprising, in a sense, when you think of what you use your computers for, after all. Y the understanding isn't produced by the computer. It's just do doing what you've tell, told it. So it produces, uh, does fantastic things, but it doesn't know what to, <laughs> what to do with those things. You see, you've got to know, you've got to have the understanding. And that's a separate thing from following the rules. And so understanding whatever it is, is a quality which requires conscious contemplation. And so it's an indication, it doesn't really tell you very much as it stands, it's an indication that uh, whatever is involved in consciousness, and I am taking the view that it is a physical process, but that tells you that if it's a physical process, that physical process has to be not a computational physical process. It has to be something outside pure computation. And so if it's physics, then that physics has to be not outside computation. Is outside computation, is there a formula or is there not? You have lower formula. Well, you, it's not a formula in the, in the ordinary sense. Relationship yeah. Like being yes. yes, it's not going to be something where you plug things in and the formula gives you the answer. But it could, be a, uh, it could be some mathematical prescription which doesn't do that, you see. You can have mathematical, like the tiling problem, you yeah. see. Given a set of tiles, will it tile or not? And one answer is one thing and the other answer is the other. I mean, it's a well-defined answer, but it's not a computational process to find that answer. But I get into a lot of trouble sometimes with people. Really crazy, we yes. Yeah, the, the argument you just gave about non-computational universe, yes. you say, well, the universe is not well, it would imply that because we're part of the universe, you see. Right. Yes. So, and it seems to me, if any of us read this, this is a phrase I uh, but uh, this is the, the core of the argument of the I that see, well. <laughs> why the actual structures of the universe require intelligence. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd have to read it. <laughs> well, I've, read, I've read parts of it in translation. <laughs> The yes. master craftsman could not have created the universe from a copy, which is sort of like saying from an algorithm. Mm. Yeah. Say exactly what you're saying. Yeah, well, it could and be that's some... Their, that's their argument. Because if the structures of the universe are not... It's not possible to have generated them algorithmically, then in your sense, mm. they had to be generated by some sort of cognitive process that's broader than that. Yes, well, the cognitive process would involve conscious understanding and... Whatever that is. Whatever that is, yes. I'm certainly not making any claim I know what it is. But, but it does make a negative claim, you see. It makes the claim that whatever it is, is not simply a computational process. It's something outside that. And one last thing is, Bob Lockhorn, who got the, right, what called the different, uni different universe, just got the Nobel Prize for superconductivity, like makes a very similar argument about emergent properties mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. relationship They are not, they could not be, have generated algorithmically. I see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
and bear with me, please, if you have told us, and maybe you tell me again. Okay. How I understand you to say that you can be sure, in some cases at least, that a given set of tiles will completely tile a plane. Yeah. How do you know that? Well, I, um, I mean, they are, it's as much of a mathematical proof as other things that one, you know, maybe we don't know anything, but, uh, <laughs> but there are <laughs> s s certain things which are, you know, in mathematical arguments which, are, which count as no, you see, they're, they're pretty, pretty rigorous statements. And it's, it's as good as any other kind of mathematical proof. I mean, the, the argument I gave you, I only basically outlined it here, but the, the tiling for these tiles, you see, the, the argument that these will I continue indefinitely is to show that you have this hierarchical procedure which will, you can make that as big as you like and you can go on indefinitely and cover the whole plane with it. So that's a set of rules that allows you to do that? Yes, yes, that set of rules. See, the, uh, sometimes people are um, under the impression that the tiles I've given you are, are non-computable in some sense. That's not true. Mm. These particular tiles certainly can be, tile, you can tile a plane in a computable way. It has a character though that it's non-local. It's a non-local thing. You can't... Uh, I can give you an example of that, which is yeah, actually... Please, is um, yeah, I can, I can... If I find the right uh, slide, I haven't... It's not... Well, you're, the, you're gonna... <laughs> there's another state... I'd have I'm to sorry. be... You have to be careful of making the statements absolutely precise with these things. Um, the tilings are not unique, although in a certain sense they are. Let me tell you the sense in which they are unique first. That is to say, if you assemble the tiles, say the kites and the darts, and one person has assembled one pattern out to infinity, because you have to imagine how you could do that, and the other one has assembled that one out to infinity, then the following is true. If you take any finite region, no matter how big, in one set, it is also to be found in the other. So as far as finite distances are concerned, there's no way of telling this pattern from that one. However, if you go all the way out to infinity, then they may be different. <laughs> so the differences, if you like, are in how the, thing, how the pattern goes out to infinity. So there are differences in... in Yes, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing to, to get your mind around in a way, but uh, I'm not sure if I can find the... If you, I'll, I'll keep looking and if you have a... Ah, here we are, I found it, yes. This is a kite dart pattern. Yes, this is to do with the non-local statement. And, and this is one of the reasons why I've been... I mean, before these quasi-crystals were discovered by Schechtman and people, I sometimes give lectures like this and somebody in the audience would ask me, doesn't this mean that there's a whole new family of crystals with different symmetries from what we've discovered? And my reaction to that would be, yes, in principle that is absolutely true, but how on earth would nature do it? And my puzzle is to do with this non-locality. See, here we have a kite dart pattern. Forget about the blue ones at the edge there. And forget about that point. Okay, there is a correctly assembled pattern of kites and darts which I could continue right out to infinity. Now I'm going to put a kite, so a, a dart on the end there. That pattern again will continue all the way out to infinity. Okay, I'm going to take that one off and put a kite on there. That pattern will continue right out to infinity. But if I put both of them on, then it's going to get stuck somewhere about there. Now you see, how would nature know when it gets to this point, it hasn't put that one, it's put that one on, but it hasn't put that one on, you see. How would it know that's wrong? It wouldn't know until it got to there that this was wrong, you see. So it could put on a kite, or it's supposed to put a kite there, but uh, how would it know not to put a, a, a dart there? So it seemed to me that the assembly of these things would have to have foreknowledge. Then my question <laughs> Yes. in using your terminology, Yeah. What do you mean by nature knowing anything? Well, it's, a it's, that's, it's uh, that's a sort of an anthro anthropomorphic way of talking about... Uh, I don't really mean knowing anything. I mean, you know, how, the, just these atoms are flying around. Imagine these are sort of atoms or something. The atom is flying around and you've got the right one has got to sit on there. And how does 
when I say nature, no. I mean, if it's going to assemble a correct tiling, there has to be something which forces this to be the other tile there. But there's no force, you see. Is there going to be a force which knows exactly that pattern? I'm only using the term no in the sense that physicists often do. It doesn't mean anybody knows anything, you see. It's just, it's just uh, a way of talking. But nevertheless, the, there has to be somehow the knowledge in the sense of the information is there to prevent this one if it's going to m make a correct assembly of these things th that knowledge has to be there but of course my own reaction to this is well all this is telling us is that if it does assemble and, and these nice patterns which I showed you seem to indicate that at least to some degree um, there is a you know these, these, th these crystalline things here some degree, uh, uh, nature seems to be able to do these things. So, but you see, nature does happen to be non-local to some degree. There are things we know about in quantum mechanics which tell us that what's going on here and what's going on here are not independent of each other. There are rules which, which couple what's going on here and what to what's going on here in a, in a way which is not local. And these, the, the way that quantum mechanics works has that kind of character. So my suspicion was that these kinds of non-local laws are actually playing a role in the way these things are made. But I don't know if that's right. It's just a guess. That's an extension of EPR, yeah. Yes, that's right. Yes, that would be an EPR thing. You see, you have individual... Imagine these things are produced... Well, when I say these things, I mean, it's, it's these actual substances are produced, I think, I don't know how these ones are made, but lo the early ones were certainly made from vapor. So you, they, they, the vapor condenses into these objects which grow. And so you imagine the sort of classical way of thinking of that is having individual atoms coming along and sitting in the right spots. But you have to imagine that quantum mechanics isn't like that. And individual atoms, they're, they're kind of... And I thought, but then I said maybe it was a test for a four-dimensional being. Because if a four-dimensional being came in the room, then it would give them a will, as you see, so I'd know they were four-dimensional. So I had this thing sitting on my desk for a long time, and it didn't seem to worry anybody. It, except one day when the ha caretaker came in, and they gave him the willy, so I assumed the caretaker was a four-dimensional being. I hope that answers your question. I haven't seen it for... I haven't seen it for years. But somebody once built another one out of Perspex or something and gave it to me, and I haven't seen that one for years either. But uh, no doubt another one could be made. It was also redone independently. I think Scott Kim, I think I have the right person, yes. made one independently. But that, but that was not, this, it wasn't uh, got from mine. He, he, he independently did it. Later, I think. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, there's one here. Can you tell how Dennis Yama got you started? <laughs> I have his modern cosmology. Oh, really? Yes. yes. Well, he was a friend of my brother's who you had... Question? Dennis Sharma. He's, he's the, point, the person to whom the book is dedicated. And uh, it says, I think, who showed me the excitement of physics. I think physics? Science. The excitement of physics. Uh, right at the beginning of the book. Now he was a, I think he was a research fellow at Cambridge when my older brother was a research student at Cambridge. And um, on one occasion I was visiting my brother. I was an undergraduate at London University studying mathematics. And uh, I had been listening to Fred Hoyle's radio talks. They were talks about cosmology. Um, I think they were eventually put into a book, but, I, but uh, they were fascinating talks. Really. They were really, you know, I had to come home from <laughs> and uh, try to make sure I was in time to hear these talks every, every, I think, they, I forget whether they were every day for a week or whether they were every week for whatever, how long it was. But uh, 
in these talks he described the steady state theory of the universe and this was the I'd never heard of it before it was an idea that the universe although expanding was never changing so it kept expanding and new material appeared uh, all the time so the, the idea was that hydrogen would be produced in the, in the space in between and that this condensed into new stars and then they gradually expanded away and the overall picture of the universe was, was that it was never unchanging a very attractive picture somehow but uh, unfortunately it got thrown out by observations eventually but uh, in this um, in these talks Fred Hoyle described uh, the distant galaxies gradually disappearing when they finally exceeded the speed of light and disappeared from view and uh, I didn't think this could be right by drawing sort of diagrams you can see that this was somewhat implausible it was somewhat inconsistent viewpoint and so when I was introduced to Dennis Sharma as a cosmologist in, in the Kingswood restaurant in, in Cambridge um, I said you know here's my opportunity so I asked him uh, about this and said how could this be and, and I drew this diagram to show that it didn't seem to make sense and he seemed to be impressed by somebody being able <laughs> to do cosmology by drawing diagrams and so he when I went to Cambridge later as a, a uh, PhD student uh, he sort of took me under his wing and taught me a lot of physics he was a very uh, first of all very knowledgeable he knew everything that was going on not just in cosmology but in other areas of physics basic physics but also he had this excitement about everything it was very infectious and uh, I, I learned an awful lot of physics from him because I'd been doing up to that point pure mathematics and Dennis later on uh, it became very distinguished from particularly from having been the supervisor of a number of very distinguished physicists Stephen Hawking being one of them and another being uh, Martin Rees who is very well known he's now the president of the Royal Society and the master of Trinity College Cambridge and various things <laughs> so uh, Dennis had a very distinguished career as a, as a uh, research supervisor. Yes, question from somewhere else? Where? Oh, I see questions. <laughs> I thought, yes, you're not supposed to ask a question. <laughs> Would somebody else like to put a question? Yeah. You mentioned uh, excitement several times. Do you have a way to try to capture that excitement in your, your students? Or well, I don't know if I, could, I don't know if I could quite do it the way Dennis did. He he really did have a lot of. Uh, he was. I think it's the excitement is infectious. That's the main thing. If you feel it yourself, then it'll it'll infect other people. And I think this was very much true of Dennis. He had it. It was really anything about science, particularly cosmology and the universe as a whole and things like this, was something that absolutely thrilled him. And and this thrill was passed from him to other people. So I think the major ingredient is to feel it yourself. Yeah. I don't know how you do that if you haven't got it. That's, <laughs> that's another problem. You could, you could, you could act it, I suppose. But I don't, think, I don't think that works as well. I think, I think you really have to have it. Um, you don't mind? Well, you start. Uh, what would you say is the most promising theory right now that is getting towards the theory of everything? Well, Can you repeat the, question again, the question was, what's the most the promising theory around, which is approaching a theory of everything? But I think I would say that there doesn't seem anything very persuasive that is approaching any theory of everything. There certainly have been claims, and the claims have been strongest from the proponents of string theory. But uh, I really don't see that uh, I think this is less persuasive now than it had been some years ago uh, it's even since my book was written I mean I'm not altogether positive about string theory in my book uh, that's the road to reality but um, even since then there has been this problem of non-uniqueness of the theory and it seems that uh, there are zillions and zillions and zillions of different versions of string theory and uh, how to settle on which one would, ha would be the right one, if any, 
depends on, well, people tend to resort to what's called the anthropic principle. So they try to argue that only those, that version of the theory in which life is possible uh, would have the right parameter values and so on. And the trouble with that is that you don't really know what it is that makes life possible. So it's, hardly, it's more or less a council of despair. So I think that uh, a little bit of the steam has gone out of the subject. But having said that, I've known occasions when the steam went out before and then it came puffing back again, so that might happen. My main troubles with string theory uh, come from the extra spatial dimensions. I, I think that some of the ideas of string theory are very attractive, and certainly the early ideas, you'll see this in the book, the early ideas um, I found very appealing. What I didn't find appealing was the requirement for, apparent requirement, that there are extra dimensions of space. You'll certainly find many people arguing that the, there's supposed to be these extra dimensions of space. I have a lot of trouble with that, primarily because I think they're highly unstable, and uh, you have all these enormous number of degrees of freedom attached to the extra dimensions, which have, to have some way of hiding. And I just am totally unconvinced by the arguments they make trying to hide these extra degrees of freedom. So I just, I don't think extra dimensions are a good thing. Um, uh, you, you know, they're supposed to be very tiny. They're wrapped up into these little tiny dimensions, which uh, are supposed to, because they're so tiny, they're supposed not to get excited. But I don't think that argument's correct. But nevertheless, uh, that's still promoted very strongly as a, as a possible approach to a theory of everything. I think instead of getting closer to a theory of everything, it's got further and further away from it as it's gone. Uh, the other approach is to quantum gravity. I'm more sympathetic towards the loop variable approach, again described in, in the road to reality. Uh, but I think it has severe problems as well. More sort of technical problems which uh, it's got stuck on. Uh, personally, I think one of the troubles with all these approaches to quantum gravity, and I'm referring here to quantum gravity, you said the theory of everything, but any theory of everything would have to encompass quant uh, some version of quantum gravity. When I say quantum gravity, I mean a theory which brings together space-time structure, which is reflected in Einstein's classical general theory of relativity, which is a marvelous theory. There's no question about that. Very, very well confirmed in observations of um, distant star systems and so on. A very, very striking theory and a very revolutionary at the time, that is in 1915 when it was finalized. A long time ago now still, getting on for 100 years old. Uh, so maybe something new will come along, but I'm sort of rambling here. Um, that theory, or something like it, needs to be combined with quantum mechanics, because quantum mechanics is fantastically successful. It applies to a huge number of phenomena uh, and uh, is a very non-intuitive theory. And my trouble with quantum mechanics is that it's in a certain sense self-inconsistent. It doesn't describe macroscopic objects in a consistent way. You see, it, quantum mechanics, I'm rambling, but maybe that's okay. <laughs> quantum mechanics involves uh, two ingredients. One of these ingredients is the uh, what's called the unitary evolution or the Schrodinger equation. There's a deterministic equation which tells you how a system evolves with time. And set against this is what you do when you make a measurement in quantum mechanics, which is a probabilistic procedure. Now, when you make a measurement, what are you doing? You've got some measuring apparatus, and that measuring apparatus, after all, is made up out of neutrons and protons and other quantum ingredients, so why isn't it treated by, as a quantum system? And the thing is, if you treat the measuring apparatus as a quantum system, you just don't get the answer that you're supposed to do when you make a measurement, so it's, it's inconsistent in that sense. And various people try to argue endlessly in ways in which to try and make sense of all that. But my own view, as was the view of not only Einstein, but uh, Schrodinger and even Dirac, although not often instead, that quantum mechanics is a provisional theory which someday will have to be replaced by something better, which doesn't have this measurement paradox in, as part of it. And my own view is that we really have to tackle that measurement paradox, and this is not tackled by any of the stand 
it's not tackled by string theory, it's not tackled by the loop variable approach to quantum gravity, it's not even tackled by my own approach of twisted theory, which is described in the book. So I think that's a big thing missing in any attempt at a, well, theory of everything I think is a bit strong, <laughs> but, but, you know, something towards a, an essentially deeper understanding of the world than we have at the moment. And uh, yeah, I think we need, quantum mechanics needs to be improved and uh, completed. My own view is that that completion has to be part of whatever quantum gravity is going to be. So quantum gravity uh, can't be just quantum theory applied to the right theory of gravity. It's got to be a, a more even-handed marriage. The, you see that sort of imposing the will, if you like, of quantum mechanics on, on the general relativity or space-time structure, whatever theory you have. I think it's got to be give on both sides, give on the side of quantum mechanics. This is actually, you might think that's a counsel of despair because after all we don't know how to do quantum gravity with, with quantum mechanics as it is, so how do we do it with a new quantum mechanics? Okay, so that's bad news. But what's good news is that quantum gravity, as we've sort of understood it up to this point, is, is more or less unmeasurable. It, it predicts effects on a scale that no accelerator would ever, you know, maybe someday, but way beyond the capabilities of any machine that's constructed now. Whereas if it's the other way around, that quantum mechanics is the one that's going to change, that is detectable by experiments which are just about on the verge of, well, on, on the borderline of what's technically possible right now. Very delicate experiments, um, maybe slightly beyond what we can guarantee to achieve with present day technology should be able to um, measure effects which are predicted by certain views about how quantum mechanics might change under the influence of Einstein's general relativity. So I regard that as a positive line. Um, it should be really pursued. And very little work has been done on it. There are a few people who have produced schemes about how quantum mechanics might change. Most of them are sort of plucked out of the sky. Uh, a few of them are better, much better motivated. And I think that's an area where um, real progress could be made if people were seriously work on it, working on it. But there are not many. So if you think of uh, the number of people who are working on string theory or even loop variable quantum, theory, uh, quantum gravity theory, that's the number of people who are working on the foundations of quantum mechanics is very, very small. So I think I've, that's, what, that's my answer to your question. <laughs> There was a question here. What do you think about the possibility that the speed of light may not be constant? Well, there have been... Uh, question? Yes, sorry, I should keep doing that. Um, the question is what I think about the possibility that speed of light might not be constant. Now, there is a theory going around, I, I, I don't know much about it, but in which this idea that the speed of light isn't constant has been promoted. I've had trouble with this just from a logical point of view, because the way we do uh, talk about the constants of nature these days, the speed of light is just a fixed number. And you'll see it's given in the book. Uh, I forget the value of it now, but it's just some exact number of meters, I think, per second. It's an exact integer, meters per second. Now, why is it that? You say, How, what an amazing fluke that it came out as an exact number of meters per second. Well, it's not an amazing fluke because basically because the measurements of time are so much more precise than the measurements of distance. You can measure time very, very precisely nowadays with appropriate kinds of nuclear clocks and so on. Um, that the way that distance is defined, now it's not the meter rule in Paris, that's far too crude, it's defined in terms of time. So it's defined so that the speed of light is that number. Or if you like, the speed of light is one in, in the so, sort of, you say, you could use seconds for your time measurement and, and light seconds for your distance measurements. That has to be one, it's, not, it's just by definition. So when a theory comes up and says, well, the speed of light is not a constant, I ask the question, what does that mean? It doesn't mean that the speed of light is not a constant, it means something else. And so you have to look at the theory and see what it really is saying. I think to say the speed of light is not a constant is just a way of sort of conveying it in, in some terms that people think they understand. The trouble is I don't understand it. <laughs> it. It doesn't mean that. It means something else. And certainly there are theories around. I'm not very positive about them. I don't think 
that's a very fruitful approach. The only thing you might have is is speed more than one kind of speed of light. You see, when I say at, clocks are extremely accurate, you might have different kinds of clock which measure different kinds of time. And this actually is an old idea which goes back to, to Milne, who was my predecessor, predecessor's predecessor in the chair that I uh, had at Oxford before retiring. And uh, he had an idea that there might be two kinds of time, sort of dynamical time and atomic time thing. That particular idea doesn't seem to be right, but uh, you could well imagine that there might be clocks constructed out of different particles and that they could measure slightly different times. There's no evidence, I should say, as far as I'm aware, there's no evidence whatsoever for that. Uh, it does seem to be the case that time measurements are, uh, that there's a, there is a very precise notion of what time is, and then space is defined in, in terms of it, and then speed light has to be one, or has to be a constant. It's, that's just by definition. So, so these theories must mean something else, and then I'm afraid I have to stop because I don't know what they do mean. But uh, anyway, the other questions? I'm happy to. Sorry that I can't do better on that right. question. <laughs> um, oh, whatever that, yes. And this is kind of odd, but and you don't have to answer it. <laughs> Having spent your life, as far as I can tell, sort of figuring out kind of how our world works, uh, you must have spent a fair amount of time thinking as I have of what is the world, which is normally a theologian's uh, problems or a prophet's or something or other and so forth. But having looked at as much as you have at, you know, trying to go back to the beginning and so forth, are there any thoughts that you'd like to share that you've had about what are we? Are we somebody's terrarium? Somebody's um, what, you say? Terrarium. Terrarium, you mean like? I mean, when I look, you know, when I look <laughs> at, a, at a fish tank, yes. uh, is, or is it the Indian idea that it just happened? Or is there any anything along those lines that you'd like to share? If you don't want to, I <laughs> totally understand. Well, uh, you say these are questions which are asked by theologians as opposed to scientists on the whole. Of course, there are some people who are both scientists and theologians. Um, I have to confess that I'm not at all a theologian. Um, I don't uh, hold to any uh, accepted religious viewpoint. Uh, I don't know that that matters from where you phrased your question. Uh, and certainly one can ask these deeper issues about you know, where it all comes from and so on. Um, I have these funny pictures in my book which represent uh, the three different worlds I refer to, the physical world of objects like this table and so on, the mental world of our perceptions, conscious, consciousness, and the world primarily of, of absolutes, primarily mathematical absolutes, and there's this kind of mystery about each, how each one seems to depend on the one before. And uh, so, okay, I think about things like that. To what extent that's answering your question, I'm not sure. You could take the view that somehow uh, each one of these lies in the world. You might say that physical reality somehow lies in mathematical reality. And then some people would say mathematical reality is to do with our perceptions and so on. And then our perceptions have to do with physical reality because after all our brains are physical objects and uh, these are but in the book I call these mysteries so I I think that we don't understand any of them but I think that it's useful to think of them in terms of each other so uh, when you ask one of these questions you think of it in the framework of the other questions so I do think for example that uh, mentality is an essential in ingredient in this whole discussion. So the whole question of consciousness and how it comes about and what it's doing there, and does it need a physical world to, to exist in, and the whole issue of physical world, how is it, why is it constrained in such a way by very, very precise mathematical laws, not just that, but laws which when you understand them have an extraordinary 
and elegance and uh, subtlety and uh, the, well, the big issues which which one can't help thinking about when uh, thinking about individual aspects of these these problems. And again, when how it is that it's, uh, mentality can have access to these mathematical things, when, which it's very hard to see we, we've created them all because the, the, most of these mathematical things are quite beyond. A good example is the Mandelbrot set, which is, which is shown in the book, uh, which is something which seems to have an existence which is entirely of a mathematical character. And OK, we can grasp bits of it from time to time. We can make computer printouts, and we can see these extraordinary patterns. But we didn't really create them. Mandelbrot certainly didn't. They were somehow out there in the, in, the, in the mathematical world. And how does one understand that sort of thing? So there are deep questions of which we, I think, have only a very limited understanding at the moment. And I hope that maybe we can gain more understanding later. Uh, yes. Newton certainly was a theologian. Yes, well, Newton, yeah, the question, well, it wasn't a question, it was a statement. <laughs> Newton was a theologian. Yes, in fact, most of his writings were about on that subject. So he was uh, certainly very interested in, in those issues. Uh, and I think not a conventional thinker in that. I think what reason he didn't publish his writings was that he would have been regarded as highly heretical had he done so. I don't know if that's the reason. But I, I heard that he rejected orders. At that time, he was supposed to be ordained. I see. To be it's, a it could be. I don't know. Yes. The question is whether he, re he rejected uh, holy orders. I suppose he may well have done, yes. But I, 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 I'm not enough of a historian to know about these things. But he was certainly a very deep thinking person, but also a very strange man at the same time. But I've never studied his religious writings at all. Yes? You said you had problems with the extra dimensions of string theory. What about the uh, imaginary parts of our three physical dimensions? Do you think they exist? Imaginary parts of physical dimensions. Um, do they exist? Well, I wouldn't take them to exist in, in the same sense as the real ones. Uh, but the, when you say the best answer I can give here has to do with twisted theory, which is described in, in the penultimate chapter of the book, uh, where one does use complex numbers. I should explain a complex number is a real number, the kind of number you use on your calculator, at least it would be if you had an infinite number of decimal places. Um, a complex number is a number like that, but where you combine it with a thing called i, which is the square root of minus one. Now, the square root of minus one, you might say, well, where on earth is that, you see? And uh, it's a very interesting thing that the history came about, uh, the history of the, the number came about from way back in, whenever it was, 16th century or something, when Cardano uh, and then Bombelli Going, yes. um, sort of ran into these numbers and found that they, you really needed them to make sense of solving cubic equations and things like this. But they were all rega regarded as a sort of fiction from, for years and years and years, but treated as, as real things by mathematicians. And, and then as time went on, they uh, became more and more useful, is one way you could say it, but also um, simplified an enormous amount of understanding of various things like uh, solving equations, um, understanding convergence of infinite series, uh, enormous numbers of things which, which are greatly simplifi simplified and our understanding deepened um, by, well, Fourier analysis is another example, by, by uh, introducing these funny numbers, complex numbers, but they were all in mathematics all the time. And then along came quantum mechanics in the early 20th century. And suddenly, uh, it's found that these numbers play an absolutely fundamental role at the very basis of physics. So they're somehow there in, in the fundamental reality that's um, presented by quantum theory. 
and it's not just that they're they're put in there as a sort of convenience. They really seem to be there as as a um, a universal ingredient of, of of how nature behaves at the smallest levels. So, but that's not quite saying that space and time have imaginary parts. Some people bring them in and use them, for example, in Stephen Hawking's approach to uh, the Big Bang, when he and Jim Hartle uh, developed their ideas about the Big Bang, they introduced what they call imaginary time. So that's saying you, the time has an imaginary part. And then you might have to say, well, space has an imaginary part as well. Uh, that's not my view. Um, my view is that you do get these complex numbers, and they come in in a very primitive way, but that's in twister space. Now you say, what on earth is that? Well, <laughs> nobody asked me that question, but <laughs> since you asked me a question related to it, I'll say uh, it's a different way of looking at space and time. See, in ordinary space and time, you think of a point, if you like. A point in space-time which means an event. Think of a point which has an instantaneous existence. And that is the primitive ingredient of space-time. But in twister theory, you don't take that view. You take, roughly speaking, a light ray. So you think of a photon, but it also encompasses the spin of the photon and its energy. And that is a sort of elementary entity. I don't mean really a physical photon. I mean the thing which you would use to describe it, which zips along with the speed of light and it spins. And if that is your primitive element, then you find that, that those things form a space which is three complex dimensions, and they are complex, automatically complex. They are, uh, that's not, you, they don't have real and imaginary parts, they're automatically complex, and that's the way the thing works. So my view is to say, well, you think of that space as in some sense the primitive reality, and the space-time that we see about us is a secondary notion which you derive from it. And that's the viewpoint that, that, that I adopt in that point of view. There is a, a sort of irony, which perhaps I should mention, which has to do with the string theory, too. In my book, I was writing in the last chapter something about string theory. Um, I think it was to do with the miracles that people come think that you see. These, these miraculous things tell us that string theory must be right, you see, that's one thing. And I was saying, well, I've seen miracles, oh, and you might call them miracles, in twister theory, which tells me twister theory must be right, too. But then I said, but they can't both be right because they're inconsistent with each other. String theory demands, well, 26 dimensions, or 10 dimensions, or 11 dimensions, or whatever it happens to be in space-time. Twister theory absolutely critically dep depends on there being three space and one time dimension. So I say, look, they uh, can't be both right. They might be neither right, but they can't be both right. OK, well, now, in uh, December 2003, Ed Witten, who is the leading light of string theory, comes along and he writes a paper on twister string theory. <laughs> so, he, so there's the irony, you see. Well, I, I imagine, fortunately, this happened before I finished writing my book, so I managed to slip it in. <laughs> so, but the thing is, what twister string theory does is it puts the strings not in an extra space dimensions, but it puts the strings in twister space, which is a very natural thing in a certain sense, because twister space is already a complex space, and the natural home of first strings is co a complex space. So that is, I think, actually quite a promising approach. And I don't know whether that's uh, driving towards a theory of everything in answer to your question earlier. But uh, at least it's, it's something well worth exploring, which there has been a certain amount of interest in the last few years. Yes, I another question. Just Sorry? Just you just have a couple of questions. All right, uh, a couple of questions and then perhaps we'll do the well, I'm eating in here, there's cookies in <laughs> Yeah, you, you had one before, but, but I don't see any other hands up, so. Oh, was there, there was one, oh yeah, down here, here's a question, sorry, yeah. In this book, you design a revised theory of uh, consciousness, and it's not computability in relation to Sorry, what was the beginning of the question? In this book, if you revise your... Oh, in the road to reality? Yes. No, I should say the road to reality Perhaps I could say a, a quick remark about how it came about. People sometimes say, why on earth did you write a book that fat, you see? <laughs> well, um, it's particularly my wife. But uh, the reason it came about was I'd, I'd written The Emperor's New Mind, which was a book about, um, to do with the issue of consciousness. But there was a lot of, of physics in it, too. 
And some people have come to me and said, well, look, I could have used that book in my course if there weren't all that contentious stuff about the mind in it, you see. And a number of people have said this to me, including, uh, well, not quite like that, but, <laughs> but uh, including my publishers, the Oxford University Press at that time. And they said, well, it would be quite nice you know, if you could produce a book, just remove all the contentious stuff about the mind, and then you can have a book. So I thought, well, all right, that sounds easy. I get my scissors out, cut out those bits, and there's the book. The trouble is, when I did that, conceptually, I didn't actually do it. When I did that, the book fell to pieces, you see, because the, there is this thread of connection, which is this question of trying to find out what on earth is consciousness all about. So I had to think of another thread, which is to do with what the laws of nature really are, at some level. So uh, that had to be, I had to put that aside. There's a little bit on, it, on that in the book, but not much at all. It is uh, something which I have hopes to do at some stage, write another book um, on consciousness and so on, which might be probably somewhat more uh, uh, at, a, at a less technical level than the one that I, ones that I wrote before. But I haven't any immediate uh, view of doing that at the moment. It's, so there is a little bit on the, on the mind, but not much in this book. It's not what it's about. I think my feeling was that I was driven to le having to learn more about the physical world. You see that the previous books are trying to argue that we are going to have to discover more about quantum mechanics and how it works before we really will be able to make any deep progress in the question of the mind. So that's, if you like, the reason that I'm not talked about it yet, but I, I haven't forgotten about the problem. <laughs> I know it's there. Yeah. Okay. I think um, there was we could go on all night, and I really want to thank Sir Roger Penrose for this wonderful Q&A. Um, this part of the evening is going to be a book signing. Uh, I have these green ropes right here, and uh, if you and us folks could kind of mosey your way over here, uh, first person in row is going to be right here, and it's just going to go along the staff wall. Um, if you have any additional questions, Mr. Penders could uh, answer them briefly. Um, I'm going to thank you for coming. If you have any books you would like signed, um, one search right here.